today's guest is a very special guest, and his name is David Ruggiero. David's a well-known executive, and he's currently the VP of Sales and an executive for Microsoft North America. Long before that, he's been an executive across EMEA and North America for some of the largest technology companies in the business. For over 20 years and through times of serious digital disruption, David has built teams, leaders, and businesses, creating technology innovative solutions and bringing customer digital experiences to life. I've asked David to join me today to share some of his experiences, share some of the stories of his background, some of the things that really shaped him into the leader and the executive that he is today. So without further ado, David, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. My pleasure. Great to be here with you, Rashan. Thank you. I want to start off first things first, you know, considering this is a leadership podcast, maybe you can share with me a little bit about what does leadership mean to you? I always view leadership as do it relatively simple, actually. I mean, leadership is the first and foremost for me. It's getting people to believe that they can do things that they otherwise don't believe they have the capability to do. And you know, digging a little deeper on that, for me, it's really about how do you drive excellence and individual excellence in a team by really leading from the front, creating energy with that team and, and demonstrating that positivity, both from a tenacity standpoint, but also from a learning standpoint. And I try to exude that with teams that I lead to just say, really, I believe anything is possible. And I believe anybody can do anything because none of us are born with an innate knowledge of a, of a subject of today, but we do learn it. And some people learn it better than others. And yes, there's a tendency to go toward your strength, but that ability to really drive that excellence out of people and really support them in their journey is for me the most critical part of leadership. I have the luxury, the privilege of observing and witnessing that and obviously following my research that I've done prior to having this conversation with you, you know, just get a grasp of your people leadership style in terms of the motivation of the individuals that you represent and serve on a regular basis. And I'll come back to that in a second, but just jumping into your specific journey and your path into becoming who you are today. You know, sometimes when you're an individual contributor, you, you, you're more often than not focusing on your little lane and it's difficult to make an impact to the people around you. Or it might be a little bit of a stretch sometimes to really contribute and motivate people based on their strengths uh, around you. So I'd like you to share a little bit about, you know, how did you get into the leadership roles that you've become? And did you have to do anything special uh, or were there any specific things that shaped you uh, to be shoulder tapped, if you will, to be the leader that you are today? You know, it's a little bit of both, as it always is. I say there's, yeah. some, there's some luck and there's certainly uh, the skill or the learnings and, and demonstrating that. So I'll start with the, the, the learning aspects of it, what I, I did, and then I'll, I'll go to the luck because it's a bit of a funny story. So the, the learning aspects of are exactly what you said. Obviously, I started off in sales and I did every drop job in sales from sales manager to a sales director. And then I be toured out into sales operations, doing marketing and comp plans and M&A work, and then back into executive sales leadership. The, the point was for me, and I think for anybody that's thinking about that, is like always focus on excellence. Never just strive to be mediocre is a, a silly saying that I have for people, because if you think about most folks in sales don't meet their goals. So if your goal is mediocrity, you're gonna fall somewhere south of that, which is not a very good place to land. So always strive for excellence. And in that striving for excellence, and you touched on it, is finding the opportunity to help others, which also helps to build your skill. And I always thought about it as a way to kind of fill in skill gaps that I didn't have, that I knew I needed as I wanted to drive my career. So if I looked at, I need technology expertise, I need certain go-to-market expertise, I need geographic expertise, hence you know the move over to Europe things like that that constantly built upon the things that I thought were critical for my end desired goal, which was to be a chief commercial officer, which eventually I was. Now, the luck part of it going back is, it, it is a funny story, it's not off color, but it's the truth. I actually met a man who mentored me, walked in a, in a men's room at, a, at an old company and we were hiring tons of people and we had not met each other. So in the men's room, you know, he said, hey, who are you? I said, I'm David and he told me his name and we just, caught a quick chat and I told him what I did for the company. And he said, hey, swing by my office and let's get caught up. And it turned out that he was the SVP of sales while I was a sales director at the time. And he just started picking my brain about how I was running the business. And it turned into this kind of 
few days a week conversation where he liked what I was doing. And when he got promoted to be the EVP for global sales for the company, he asked me to come and be his chief of staff and move to the corporate headquarters. And that kind of started my journey on what became about 20 corporate moves with companies to take on new roles. So it was a luck that I happened to just run into him at that moment. But then obviously he saw the talent and the capability that I had, but he guided me, mentored me and coached me and gave me the opportunity. And I always took that to pay it forward that when I see talent for people that don't have that job yet, but I know they've got the talent that I give those people that opportunity. And it's been fantastic. And that was 20, over 20 years ago. That's a great story. I appreciate the perspective and around luck as well. Uh, I appreciate the humility around you describing that. But if I were to ask you during that story specifically, if there was one thing that was that attracted him to your style and your skill set, what would you say that would that would be? Yeah, that that came out of the conversations that we have. Is he just he saw the discipline and the tenacity with which I ran my business. So at the time, you know, I had hired a brand new team. And I had two peers that were doing the same job. I said sales director, I was actually a sales manager at the time, first line sales manager. And there were three of us. And he noticed that the difference in my results to the other two folks' results was literally about two and a half times better performance relative to quota on my team than the other teams. And that's when I created this model that I called the science of sales. And he just loved that I had this discipline process around, which nowadays seems so basic that tools do it. But you know, thinking back, 23 years ago, we didn't have all the systems and tools that work today. And I built out this very simple process flow of pipeline, understanding close rates, close rates by individuals, cycle time through sales, red, yellow, green process on, on deals where they were in your pipeline. And I was able to articulate what was happening in my business at any moment in time across any one of my 10 people and all of my top customers. And he was just blown away at the level of, of specificity that I can articulate the business to much different than anybody else. And I didn't really realize it at the time, quite frankly, it was just what I thought I needed to do that I took how I did it in sales and doing it into sales management and ended up being an incredibly wild, a wildly successful way to run the business. And what it also drove though, is not only understanding that science of sales, but it drove the connectedness of the team because the team knew that I was engaged and involved with them on their deals, and I was there to help them and guide them across their deals. So we became a very, very tight, collaborative, high-functioning unit. Yeah, great perspective around just the organization and the structure that it has been implemented or has been displayed of your overall style, right? And I know you and I have a conversation or two about football, and it's, a lot of it is pretty much described in the analogy of displaying results and displaying skill sets on the field and in the game for you to get shoulder tapped or hand picked at some times, right? Above and beyond right. uh, what a resume or a track record might look like. And one of the things you talked about in the previous answer was around paying it forward. And I, I noticed that as well, because you're leading leaders, you're not leading individuals on a regular basis. You're making, you, you ha you're in a position to make an impact across multiple organizations and multiple different teams as well. Uh, how do you foster the leadership uh, with individuals that want to move into a leadership role, like specifically, uh, how do you put yourself in a position to identify the ones, like the story where you've been identified that have the passion and the knack and the skill set for making that impact across people and you foster and you coach that into a desired leadership role? That's the, the most fun part about doing this job. <laughs> I've got a lot of stories on it. I'll, I'll, I'll tell them in a generals so i don't give away any names some of them are here at microsoft and some of them are at, at other of my past companies i think the number one thing for me though that i've learned in this 20 plus years of, of senior leadership is don't take somebody else's opinion of a person as a fact about the capabilities of that individual and assess each individual leader on your own merit or on their own merit but on your own perspective on what you think their capabilities truly are. And why that's so important is there, so many leaders have so many different styles. Some of them are great and some of them are really bad. And if you're asking a bad leader who isn't a good coach, who isn't a good mentor, who doesn't give specific actionable feedback to somebody and then says that that person isn't coachable or isn't the next level of capability, it's just not a good opinion. And 
I've seen that a lot in my career where when I spend time with individuals, I, I, I understand the perspective that others have had of why they see maybe they're not ready for something, but then most of the time, almost all the time, I see that those leaders that in, in the case of today or in my career that I've been coaching, they need specific actionable feedback and coaching and critical coaching, critical or constructive criticism that can help them advance in their career. Because simply telling somebody what they're not good at, but not showing them what that good could look like or should look like and what it means to them, then it, it's just wasted effort. And if you can do that with, with team members, you have to be able to make that personal connection. You have to be able to adapt it for each one of those individuals on your team, and you have to mean it. That's the most important. You can't fake that you care. You can't fake that you're taking a genuine interest. So I've done that many, many, many times in, in my career, and I love seeing talent develop and getting out of their comfort zone to reach their goals because it reminds me of when I did it, you know, 23 years ago. And I had somebody ask me just last week, uh, a earlier in career individual and said to me, do you remember when you were my age and you try to get to that first job? I said, of course I remember. Like they think it was so far away that I couldn't actually remember. So I could remember every action that happened, every moment and every interaction that I had that helped me get there. And that support is critically important. That's incredible. It, you have to be intentional and be consistent. And so that compounds and puts you in a position of impact that you are in today. You've seen a lot of leaders You've managed and led and coached a lot of leaders along your during your time. What are some of the biggest mistakes new leaders make? Great question. I, there's there's several. I'll try to knock it down to a few. I mean, number one, first and foremost, is not setting clear goals and and strategy for the organization. And I always say, when you take on a new uh, organization, the number one thing for me that I've always said is we have to have a clear definition of success. So it's we and clear. And the reason I say that is because in order to operate effectively as a team, you can't have 10 people saying there's 10 different things that mean the team is successful. There might be individual things that make them successful, that they define success, but we need to organize around what is success for the team. Because if we do that, then we have clear line of sight about how we're going to communicate broadly to our organization. So. You know, that would be, um, you know, the number one thing that I would say is, is the most important thing for leaders to do that. The, the other traps that leaders can get caught into is, is doing the work on behalf of people uh, as opposed to creating a list of, hey, these are the things I'll help you with. These are the things I won't help you with uh, because you have to give them the latitude to make mistakes and learn through those mistakes. Uh, the third piece would be not actually letting people do their job. And I always have an example. Uh, I use the Warren Buffett analogy. Somebody asked Warren Buffett, he's a big baseball fan, and they asked him, how do you develop such great talent? And he said, I hire 400 hitters, and I don't teach them how to swing. And too many leaders will get in, and somebody's got a great process, great flow, great leadership, and they'll say, nope, I need you to do it my way. And you've got to be comfortable as a leader to understand that there are many different ways to attack a problem. And therefore, you're going to have many different perspectives on how teams are led and managed and keep that learn it all mentality about there's different ways to do it. They can all come out to the same result. They can be introverts. They can be extroverts. They can be strategic. They can be more execution oriented. But if they're working, leverage those skills and then build upon them with the team. What has been one of your biggest failures as a leader? I went into a leadership organization, a leadership role a few years back, and I, I actually didn't do all the things that I just said that, that are, are important. And it was kind of because I, I got stuck in a situation where I was part of the team, newly part of the team, and then got promoted to run the team just a few months later. And admittedly, there were people on the team that were more deserving, air quotes, at the time to have that job, but I was given the job. And I didn't stop and slow down enough to actually build the trust and the connection with the team because everything was happening so fast in, in the specific company that I was working at. And it ended up building a lot of animosity, a lot of animosity on the team. 
which then got me defensive uh, because I, I always say this like you know my core anyone's core traits you know is the 80 percent what you always know you're going to do versus the 20 percent i call it the two sides of the personal coin so my the side i know i need I, I know i always have is i get defensive quickly and i'm quick to judge when i feel like i'm being attacked and i right. need to be more patient and empathetic and less judgmental and in that case when i felt i was being attacked i should have really just really throttled back back on aggressiveness and really amped up on empathy and understanding about the situation that this whole organization was put in and and it ended up not having the best result and so how did you get out of that? Um, you know, I, I worked over a two year period of just trying to build those those connections uh, more individually and it got better, um, but it never got to the point where I I know it could have been, you know, much like my team is functioning now, which we're a highly functioning, collaborative, supportive team. Uh, it never actually got there. It got much better, but I got some pretty tough, critical feedback on 360s from that team. Some of it was justified, some of it wasn't, as is, is usually the case. But I, I think I made some really good breakthroughs on about 30% of the team, good enough breakthroughs on 30% of the team, and still had very challenging time with, with the remaining 40%. Right, right. And that's important, right? That's important. A lot yeah. of those attributes that you talked about there in terms of the empathy, in terms of being able to take an emotional step back or a few steps back, and just really observe like exactly what these challenges are and then exercise your strengths, but also exercise the passion that you've described earlier on around why you're in a leadership role in the first place, right? It is to help yeah. people. And I know it gets the better of, of, of every one of us, right? We're human beings at yeah. the end of the day to, to get into that defensive approach, right? And, yeah. uh, and that challenging approach. My series involved a lot of individual contributors, up and coming leaders that are seeking coaching, seeking perspective and seeking advice on how to transition and, and how to hone in on their craft to just become leaders one day or better leaders at what they do. And I'd, I'd love to ask you, what advice do you have, in addition to some of the things you've described around the relationship building, around understanding the team's superpowers or the individual superpowers and ex exercising that through successful motivation and being intentional and consistent. Outside that, what advice do you have for up and coming leaders today that are watching this, that want to learn and grow? Yeah, I think, Leadership now is is it's always evolving, first of all, and it's vastly different than it was when I first became a senior leader. And I think the thing that I've learned the most that I think is critical for any leader jumping into a role right now is becoming demonstrating much more vulnerability about what you don't know. Mm. I think that that authenticity to a team is incredibly helpful because it, it breaks down the barrier of trust, lack of trust or fear that my my boss is going to try to, you know, outthink me or, you know, show me up in a meeting, those kind of things. And I, I tell my team now all the time, I think a great thing to do is I start a, a lot of emails with, I need help. And I said, you know, if somebody grew up in my generation, you know, if you said you need help at work, that was kind of a death sentence that it was you, you're not capable. But I think in today's environment, it's too hard for anybody to know everything. And that asking for help, demonstrating that vulnerability is a critical leadership trait to building trust, a high trust team and a team that can work more collaboratively. That'd be number one. Number two is you, you've got to find a way that you can get the best out of everybody on the team that they're going to share critical feedback on the spot that's with the spirit of making the team, the organization, the company better. And when you have that, and I think I certainly have that on my team today, there's nothing that's off limits. And we can, we can stop in a moment and give on the spot feedback and coaching. And that, that ability to do that and that the rest of the team sees the trust that it drives, I think is absolutely phenomenal for building the capabilities of the team that when some you know that they've truly got your back, you can do anything. That, that's amazing. That, that trust and that level of comfort and that level of emotional stability yeah. is so crucial with fostering success within a team, right? Which is one of the reasons, uh, you know, many people love working in your organization is because of that, right? And I'm sure everybody working in your organization would, would uh, but commend that, commend that culture and, 
And I love the fact that you start your emails off by saying you need help, right? That level of vulnerability like just brings you down to a very authentic level with the team that really creates that element of trust. One of the things I've noticed about you personally was your ability to respond and interact with the team regardless of the level of that individual. And so more often than not, uh, you know, I engage with leaders on a regular basis. Uh, I'm personally on a mission to really understand the awesome science behind leadership. And I've noticed that uh, it's not very often that senior leaders in the business uh, are as accessible and as communicative as, as you deem to be. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, first of all, thank you for noticing. It, it's something that I'm, I won't say I'm intentional about it because it is just who I am. Uh, maybe you could define that as being intentional. I think back to that comment I made to you about a earlier in career individual in our org last week asking me that. And I remember everything when I was a kid starting off when I was 21 years old right out of college and these fearful conversations that I had with leaders many levels above me and many of them just ignoring the question, never giving any feedback, never doing anything to actually impact the, the business. And I, I just remember back, I mean, it's 30 years ago, but I remember back how awful it made me feel and how I was very jaded about corporate America, air quotes, you know, what it felt like to be in corporate America. And I just vowed never to be like that. And I, I just felt you could get so much more with being open and honest and not giving the politically correct business answer, but actually getting your hands dirty and helping people to do the work. That along with the, the mentorship story of the, the guy that I met that, that got me into my first executive career. And I just thought, wow, I mean, there's so many people that feel like I felt in my 20s that they know they can do more. They know that they're better than a lot of what they're seeing happening. They know that they can speak with the voice of the customer or voice of reason or a better way to drive processes or discipline or sales or productivity in the business. But people just don't spend the time to ask because they're not at the right level. And it just got to this point for me that said, I want to just hear as many opinions as I can and help guide individuals that says either A, I love what you're telling me, we're going to go action on it, or better yet, I'm going to bring you in to go pitch it so we can action on it, or B, ask them questions. Have you thought about th a different way of looking at the problem you're bringing, or have you thought about acting a different way? Maybe you're not showing up as well as you think you are. And the interesting thing, Rashawn, is that when I give feedback, because I give very straight up, direct, appropriate uh, feedback to people, most times they will say they've never gotten that feedback or they never get any coaching from their leader. So that stuff to me just kind of is a nice self-fulfilling prophecy to myself that it's important. They need it. They want it. They're not getting it. And when you give them that feedback and you can help an individual grow at any level in an organization, you never know who the next me is going to be. And I right. want to see that for people. And it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling to see people develop and grow and get the jobs that they want. And I, I still remember how great it was for me. And I still feel great about when I get cool jobs or raises or, you know, close a big deal or whatever it may be. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a little it's, bit of fuel for you as well there. Yeah. You know, on, the, on the, the other side of that, you know, when you talk to a lot of sales individuals and, and more often than not, when you ask them, like some of the things that they want to get good at, uh, you often hear that some of the sales individuals are trying to get good at talking to a CFO, talking to a CEO, yeah. talking to a high profile executive, right? And so by virtue of the fact that you create that space for the teams to have access to you as an executive, really organically creates that level of comfort with them yeah. talking to senior people within an organization that grows the skills that they're, yeah. they're, they're having challenges with or they're seeking growth on, right? So I love that. I love the whole approach and the respect that you take as you do that as well. Switching gears totally, okay. I want to ask you, what do you do for fun? How do you switch off? How do you disconnect and just take care of yourself? So first, you know, again, on a vulnerability standpoint, I want to say that I've had so many people in my career tell me, you don't look like you're ever stressed. You look like you got it all figured out and you're so confident when you're up on stage. And I say, thank you, but you got me all wrong. I'm always stressed. Um, I got a lot of anxiety. Um, I am comfortable on stage, but I definitely have the nervous butterflies when, you know, before I get up on stage. And I think that's important to, you know, and I didn't used to say that to people. I think it's important for them to know because, you know, part of life 
uh, is you, how do you handle those things? And I just recently said to my wife a couple of, well, about a month ago, our twin boys are now in college. And I said, this is the first time in my adult life that I don't feel stress every day because I took such pressure on being a provider, saving for college, paying for the house, vacations, da, 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 a lot going on. So I found ways to always decompress and, and, and just get away from work. Couple of things. Number one, and I encourage everybody to do this. When I go on vacation, I delete my email. I don't, I, I don't try to play catch up when I get back. And I tell people, figure it out. You're adults, you're mature leaders, figure out a way to do it. Number two, I do, I'm active every day. Um, I've been a practitioner of yoga for 18 years. Uh, I recommend it for everybody who will do it. It's great for mental stress. It's great for physical strength. Uh, it's great for mental strength as well. Everything. I mean, it's just fantastic. And you know, I'm I'm just somebody who likes to move. So I don't. I'm not a. I have to go on my bike every day. I'm not that. You know, or I have to go run every day. But I will either run, walk, bike, swim, yoga, lift weights but I do one or many of those every day. And it's just my way to, to get away. And I and through my career, lastly, I'll just say, I always said that I'm going to make after hours and weekends sacred to the most possible extent I could. Having my job, sometimes that was difficult. But if you let your boss, no matter what level you are in, in life, start to take advantage of your after hours time, you, you got to cut that off early. And I, I did that. I, I learned that myself early in my career. I had a boss who kept trying to schedule meetings on a Saturday or a Sunday. And I just said, if it, if you can't organize your week that you have enough time to talk to me between Monday and Friday, that's your problem, not mine. And that's just what I believed. And, you know, they didn't like it at the time. And frankly, I, I didn't care because you can't impart, uh, you can't talk to talk, you know, to say one thing and do something else to your team. So, I think it's a little bit of everything, but I encourage everybody to, it's okay to walk away in the middle of the day and take a walk or go work out and you shouldn't feel guilty about it. That's a great place to leave it, David. Thank you so much. You know, I'd love to do a part two with you to talk a little bit about the uh, the science of selling that you talked about earlier on. Yeah. Uh, but I think this is a great place to leave it. Uh, so much, so much of good nuggets out of this conversation. So much of good quality learnings. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. I appreciate you taking the time to share. And I also appreciate your vulnerability and your authenticity at the same time. Thank you so much. I, I'm fortunate to have you in my network and know you, so appreciate that. My pleasure, Sean. Thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it.